in Victory Church. I'm excited to be in the house of the Lord with you. I invite you to stand with us. I tell you what, the God of all hope, of all peace, and of all joy is here this morning. He's been speaking. He's been moving already this morning as we've been practicing as a worship team. And uh, we're just excited to enter into his praise, uh, to the praise of him with you this morning. Uh, we have this first song is actually going to be a new song, but I still encourage you and invite you to worship with us, um, even, if it's, even if that's just listening to the words and meditating on them. So, uh, so here we go.
Good morning, Victory Church. You may be seated. It's great to see you all here this morning. It's so wonderful to be part of church, to be a part of a church where family gets together every week to praise God and, and to be discipled by people around them. And yeah, it's just, it's just such an honor. If you're visiting us this morning, we're very glad you're here. We hope you feel welcomed. We're a church that loves people and loves God, and we think that God brought you here for a very specific reason, and we're glad to be part of that. We have room in the upper room. If it's a little tight around you and you'd like to have a little extra space, we have sound up there. You can see through the glass, and you can really be part of the service. So if you'd like to get some extra space around you, please feel free to, we got stairs on both sides. You can go to the uh, upper room and participate in the service. You will see in the seats in front of you, we have what we call our connect cards. There you find information about our church. If you want to sign up for certain things, if you have prayer requests, if you'd like to see a pastor, if you'd like to tell us what your next step in your spiritual walk would be, use those cards and you can uh, fill that out as appropriate and put them in the giving boxes in the back of the church or at the welcome center uh, where we'll have somebody there after church as well. Well, think, a couple of things that Victory Church believes in. We believe that lost people are important to God, and he wants them found. And we believe that prayer is the primary work of the Christian and of a, of, yeah, of a Christian part of God's family. And so what we do is the second Sunday of each month, we have the prayer of three. And that's this Sunday. And what I'd like you to do is during the next two worship songs, if you would please Ask God what three people, or up to three people, I should say, that he would place on your heart, that he would like you to pray for, participate in their salvation plan, so that when the right uh, seeds are planted, when, when the watering is done, that those seeds can take growth. But we are asked to pray, because without prayer, the seeds could land on rocky ground, could land on, on ground with thorns around it, but we can prepare the soil through our prayers. So please, during these next three songs, Ask God which three loved ones, family members, uh, friends, coworkers, whatever that would be, God has put you in their lives for a particular reason, and the primary, our primary job in this world is prayer. And so during the next three songs, please consider those three that you would like to pray for. Would you stand with me and pray as we continue our worship service? Heavenly Father, we pray that our worship and our praise would be honoring to you. We humble ourselves before you and exalt you as king of the world and Lord of our lives. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here this morning. There's no place in this building you're not invited. We want your way to be our way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as I was praying this week for worship, Lord, what do you want to do through worship this coming Sunday? A reminder came to me of a study that I had done in the past of a revelation that the Lord had given me. And the revelation was the difference between a pile of rocks and an altar is the sacrifice. And that was brought to my attention, my memory of this study that I had done. So then I went back and I was like, a sacrifice, a sacrifice as it pertains to praise and worship. And I was led to Hebrews, Hebrews 13, 15, I believe, where um, it's written that continually offer up a sacrifice of praise, And I like to word search, so I looked up that word sacrifice, which is written originally in the Greek, and forgive me if you speak Greek and I say this word wrong, but it's T-H-Y-S-I-A, and I think it's pronounced thusea. But that word can also not just be translated as sacrifice, but the sacrificing of the thing that makes you a victim. A victim is another word that is used of that, thusea, a victim. And to lay that thing down, and as I began praying, I saw this imagery which I believe was from the Lord, of this man throwing this ball to this dog and this dog going out and retrieving it and the dog coming back with the ball and the man saying, oh, good job, good boy, you're so good. And offering this praise to his dog. And I saw this imagery of a mom who is watching her daughter come out of her room with her mismatched shoes and her mismatched top and bottom and she doesn't look really well put together, but the mom was praising her, good job, you've dressed yourself, well done. I saw this imagery of this family sitting on a couch watching a sporting event and cheering, yeah, high five, we rock, we rule, the team's awesome. And I felt the Holy Spirit saying, you know, as a nation, as a people, in our Christendom, offering praise is so easy. Offering praise is so easy because it costs us really nothing. 
the man bending over to his dog, it didn't cost him anything, maybe the arm strength to throw the ball, maybe a little bit of time to teach the dog how to do that. But it really didn't cost him anything, and he was able to praise. But a sacrifice of praise, that thing that maybe is making us feel like a victim, maybe our physical health, why me? Why me? Maybe our financial situations, maybe discord in our family, maybe our political or theological beliefs, those things that are making us feel attacked, victimized, or unjustifiably wronged, and laying those things down as the sacrifice of praise continuously. Continuously laying those things down. So I said, okay, God, search my heart. Search my heart, oh Lord. And if there's anything that I have been holding on to that has prevented me from praising you, Lord, bring that to my mind. And I believe he did, but I believe that this, this encouraging word was also for you, that if there's a thing maybe multiple things this morning that are weighing heavy, again, whether it's finances or health or family or whatever that thing is, but asking the Lord truthfully, sincerely, Lord, search my heart and know me, not me let, let me not be found wanting and take that thing and lay it on maybe what was a pile of rocks and turn that place into an altar of worship. As we sing this next song, I pray that the Lord reveals those things to you and you can worship with us freely. In the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy.
to me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness Heavenly Father, we stand on your word. We stand on your truths. You have been faithful to us. You have only good plans for us. You are the source of all good. Thank you, Lord, for walking with us, for guiding us, for inspiring us, for giving us revelation that we can lead our lives by, truths we can stand by. And Heavenly Father, we pray for those loved ones who don't know you as Lord and Savior, for those who have not committed their lives to you through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that this week, in fact, at this moment, Lord, that you start a new work in their life, that Holy Spirit, you would move in their hearts. You would convict them of the things that are leading them away from you. And Father, we pray that the things that they desire that would not be of you, Lord, you would turn them against them that if there are things in their lives that are bad for them, that they would de desire them less, that they would get less pleasure from them, Lord, all with the purpose of drawing them to you. And Lord, we pray that they, you would use us, that they would see our good works and give you the glory through your son, Jesus Christ. Be with our loved ones this week. Draw them close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And we'd like to direct your attention to the announcements at the screen. Welcome to Victory Church. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. The message will begin in just a few minutes, but first we'd like to share some announcements. Men, you are invited to the next men's breakfast coming up this Saturday at 7.30 a.m. over at our New London campus. You'll hear a message from the Word from Pastor Derek Nett, and of course, a hearty breakfast and great fellowship. Grow in your relationship with the Lord by participating in one of our discipleship classes. They're offered in person and via Zoom. So when you register, you'll get a link with more details. In Wapaka, we have Hearing the Voice of God, and in New London, we have the Book of Daniel. If you have any questions or we can help you in any way, please come see us over at the Welcome Center or scan the QR code on the Connect card in front of you. Again, we're so glad that you're here and we hope you enjoy worshiping with us today. Hey teens, grades four to six, you are now dismissed to your class in the prayer room. 
there for a minute, I thought I was watching a foreign film, you know, where the lips didn't quite match the words there. It's kind of funny. You know, when my kids were little, one of the things when we were bored, we would turn the TV volume all the way down, and then we would, like, make up whatever it is that they were saying. It was hilarious. You could add impromptu there. Next time the lips and the voice don't match, we'll put the volume down, and we'll add our own words to it. Anyway, praise God. Hey, open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Acts, chapter 5. Acts, chapter 5. We're going to cover verse by verse, probably better than half of the chapter. So we're going to be reading verses 17 through verses 40. I intend to preach uh, expository and combine a little bit with a topical sermon this morning. And I'm going to be emphasizing Gamaliel, who is a key character here in uh, Acts, chapter 5. And I'm going to be talking about discretion. About 20 years ago, uh, I set out to write a book. It was called When the Older Saints Come Marching In, and it was intended to help young ministers coming into the ministry how to deal with and treat correctly older saints. I never published it, but I learned a great deal about um, some of the senior saints that were in our church 20 years ago. Uh, Some of you may remember Carol Tradell. She was uh, quite an influence in my life during that whole writing of the book uh, 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 series or time time period, and one of the things that stood out that there was a generation that had discretion. Discretion was one of those things that stood out. That seems to me that for the passage of time, discretion is lacking. And today, I want to teach you really the power of this word, what it means. And why we as believers, we as the Christians, need to get back to this idea of discretion. There's a tension uh, oftentimes that I feel, because as we've been talking about sensibility, and sensibility is seeing the bigger picture, understanding the complexities, and I've made many decisions in my life without the full facts, not knowing exactly what was uh, involved. I would make a decision, later find out the true facts about a matter, And then I would like, why didn't somebody tell me? My decisions would have been different if I would have known these other factors that affected my decision-making process. So the tension in the air is how do we inform people about things that are happening, you know, the, the things that are going on without divulging confidences? And of course, we as a church, we're, we're constantly hearing things from people and about people, and we have to keep those things in confidence, and we want to honor what we call the confessional. We want to honor all those things that we're hearing about and the things that are happening around us. And at the same time, decisions are being made and we're constantly struggling. How do we inform people about what is happening so that they can make the right decisions without compromising confidentiality? And you in a household may feel the same thing. How do we inform our kids of the danger of certain things and at the same time, we don't want to reveal to them some of the mistakes of our own past, or even somebody that you know, a loved one that you know, you, you, you know that your children may be heading down the same path, that there might be some type of a generational uh, influence on our children, and we want to talk to our children about these things, but at the same time, we don't want to disclose maybe something that grandma or grandpa did. So discretion is defined this way, the freedom to decide what should be done in a particular situation, your discretion, turn left, or turn right? Where do you want to go? Hey, let's go on vacation. You pick the place. It's at your discretion. Pick whichever color you want. Spend the money on whatever you want. This is a foundation from God. God gives us the choice. He says it. It's it's up to your discretion. Choose life, choose death. There's that first definition of discretion. Then there's that second definition, which is the quality of behaving or speaking in such a way as to avoid casting offense or revealing private information without revealing private information. Can't you keep this discreet? Let's be discreet about this. So how do we help people in their decision-making processes without revealing confidentiality or even history or pasts that basically could influence the decisions that we're making? And that's the tension that is in the air. And today I want to preach, and I hope to give you some really wise solutions on how to navigate maybe this particular complexity. So in the book of Acts chapter 17, we know that at the beginning, the church is being formed. Acts chapter 5, it talks about the beginning of the church, the apostles, they have hundreds of people that are gathering to them. In fact, they formed 
a commune type of living. It's a, it's a, people were selling all that they had. They were giving it to the apostles. Nobody had lack of anything. Anytime somebody needed something, they'd take it out of the treasury. Everybody was eating. Everybody had clothes. Everybody had shelter. <clears throat> it was an experiment. It was a social experiment until Ananias and Sapphira, where they sold a piece of land and they only give half the money to the church, but they said that they were giving all of the money to the church. And Peter says, why have you lied against the Holy Spirit? You didn't have to sell it. You didn't have to give it. You didn't have to. There was no obligation, but lying to the Holy Spirit. Now, that's, that's just downright criminal. And that day, Ananias and Sapphira, both on two different occasions, but the same day they died, the Holy Spirit took their lives for lying in this community against the Holy Spirit. They should have been more discreet in their decision-making processes. So now they've moved to Solomon's portico or Solomon's colonnade, which is a, a little part of the temple. And the apostles would gather with the people and the people would come and receive the teachings that the apostles had. And literally thousands of people were coming to the Lord, even though now Ananias and Sapphira, it scared everybody. And the Bible says, and nobody would join them. So there was this fear that had taken over, but at the same time, it was a sovereign move of God and great healings were taking place. People would bring their sick and, and the apostles would lay hands upon them and they would recover. In fact, they would put people out in the street hoping that as Peter walked down the street, the shadow of Peter would fall upon them and they would be healed. That's how intense the move of God was <clears throat> at the beginning of chapter 5. And then we pick up in verse 17 of chapter 5 and it reads as follows. And it says, And the high priest and his officials, who were Sadducees, they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees, they did, but the Sadducees, they did not. So if you ever wonder which one believed in the resurrection, the Sadducees did not, the Pharisees did. They did not because they were sad, you see. So the Sadducees, they were filled with jealousy. They could only see the crowds. They could only see the momentum <clears throat> and that they were losing momentum. So what they did is in verse 18, they arrested the apostles. We believe that there were 10 of them that were arrested. So they arrested the apostles and they put them in public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. Then he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. Turn to your neighbor and say, give the message of life. This is our commission. This is what God has called us to do, to give the people this message of life. King James Version writes it this way, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. This life can be dominated by the Spirit-filled experience. What I mean by that is where the Spirit of the Lord guides you in every major decision. Even though you have discretion, you say, Lord, help me with my decision-making process. And the Holy Spirit who dwells within us will. <clears throat> so the apostles, they obeyed. Verse 21, it says, so at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple as they were told and immediately began teaching. So when the high priests and their officials arrived, they, con they convened the high council, the full assembly of elders of Israel. Now, this is a big deal. They've got these apostles, 10 of them. They're in jail. So they called all of the elders together. We've got to make a decision here what to do with these apostles. The gospel is spreading. We're losing control. We're losing our power. We've got to do something. So they call all of the elders together. And it is believed by some that Paul, the apostle, before he becomes an apostle, but he's trained under Gamaliel, he is probably attending this, not as an elder, but attending it as an understudy of Gamaliel. So he's understanding what is happening here in the temple. This is a formidable period of time for Paul. Paul is observing this. And Paul will develop out of this meetings a hatred for the Christians, which of course we know later on the road to Damascus, he realizes that he's persecuting God himself. And of course, Paul is converted on the road to Damascus, but this high council, the full assembly of the elders, they're called together. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail to trial. But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they returned to the council and reported the jail was securely locked. We've already investigated. We do not know how this has happened. Clearly, it's a miracle. There's not a spy. There's not a conspirator. 
It's something that has happened, but it was securely locked with the guards standing outside. But when we opened the gates, no one was there. Verse 24, so when the captain of the temple guards and the leading priests heard this, they were perplexed. They were scratching their head until they were bald like me. And they asked themselves the question, where will this all end? I've asked myself recently with all the historical things that are happening, at least recent history, wondering where will this all end? All this that is happening, what's the end game, God? It's interesting that the angel says, go to the temple and teach the people this way of life. While these other people, the Sadducees and the temple guards are wondering, where will this all end? We know where this all ends. We know where this all ends. God is victor. God wins. God's way wins. No matter who wins elections, no matter what may happen in the political scene, no matter what is done behind closed doors or in public, I'm telling you God wins. This is the way of this life. And this is what you and I need to be about. So verse 25, it says, So then someone arrived with the startling news, the men that you put in jail are standing in the temple teaching the people. The captain went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles. And it's interesting here how they said, but without violence. The temple guard was quite concerned of how they were going to do this without violence, for they were afraid that the people would stone them. And again, Paul, who was only uh, uh, four years younger than Peter, Paul, who was only four years younger than Peter, he's experiencing all this. He's seeing all of this. He's seeing that the way of life that he had is being eroded. That is, he was convinced that this Jewish worship and this, this temple way, it had to be preserved this particular way. He's seeing some things eroding. And of course, Paul rises up in anger, but the apostles, of course, are, are not. Peter stays quite calm and he goes with them. He, he follows the instructions, at least of these uh, 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 these temple guards. And so in verse 27, it says that when they were brought, then they brought the apostles before the high council where the high priest confronted them, saying, we gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name, he said. Instead, you have filled all of Jerusalem with your teaching about him, and you want to make us responsible for his death. Make no doubt the message was quite clear, and they got it. Yes, you sent the Messiah to the cross. They, they know what the apostles were standing for, and they say it again, that Christ, yes, died, he was buried, but on the third day he rose again, and he has power in heaven, and he has power on earth, and that is why the angel says, speak to the people about this life, this life, the life that God intends here on earth, and the life that God intends for us in heaven, verse 29, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. God has an opinion about how we live in this life. So verse 30, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him and hung him on a cross. Then God put him in the place of honor at the right hand as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. And 32, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey Him. Folks, you and I have been empowered with the Holy Spirit to navigate this life. This is the message the angel told the apostles to go to the temple and say. So I'm here to tell you, folks, you and I have not lost anything. We have been victors since Jesus Christ rose again. The Holy Spirit is breathing on you and I, and you know what? Our job now, our job now is to teach as many people who are willing to listen this way of life. You know, if I was the enemy, if I was the enemy like the devil is, and I had the power to somehow destroy, the first thing that I would do is back in March, I would send a plague and make everybody stay home. Get them away from sound teaching behind the pulpit. Confuse their thinking by all of the internet junk that's out there. And feed people a whole bunch of stuff that weakens them. 
and I would essentially destroy the church. You know people believe across the world that the church was making an incredible comeback. The people were thriving under the teaching of the Lord. Churches were growing. And almost overnight, an epidemic shutting everything down. And it seems as if there was a hiccup in the church. But I'm here to tell you, folks, that hiccup is long gone. Because the way of life that you and I teach, it's rooted in the truth. And the apostles say that, that it is, it is witness. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, who is given by God to those who obey him. That is you and I. That's you and I. We've lost nothing. Now, the commission to let people know, hey, there is a better way of life. It's the Spirit-led life. Verse 33, when they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. But anytime that there's an action, there is this cautionary tale of but, a preventive moment. But one member, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, now you need to know this, this is the Gamaliel that trained Paul. Paul at one point says that. He says, look, I, was, I went to Jerusalem. I was sent there from Tarsus by my parents to train under the most renowned scholar, which is, which is this scholar Gamaliel. Now, it's interesting that when you have good parenting, you have good seed. I'm talking about Gamaliel here training Paul. Gamaliel was open, and I think the reason why Paul was called by God on the way to Damascus is because there was this foundation. I think Gamaliel was a real seeker. Even though he wasn't altogether convinced about Jesus, I think Gamaliel, who was an expert in the law, I think he understood that there were some things that were happening. I think that he was quite sensible. He could understand the complexities of the kingdom of God, and he just would not reduce his thinking to the simple one-liners of the other Pharisees that were sad, you see, or the Sadducees that were sad, you see, and so here Gamaliel, he stands up and it says here that he was an expert in religious law and respected by all the people. He was an expert in religious law and he was respected by all the people, which brings me to my first point, that we like Gamaliel must become experts and respected advisors about this way of life. Now there's a lot of things that we can learn. We can learn business, we can learn politics, we can learn all kinds of different things. But I really believe that the world needs today this that we're able to teach them, this way of life. And we are better off with the Spirit of God guiding our every decision. It heals marriages, it heals broken hearts, it heals businesses, it heals nations. And if any time there is a need for our nation to hear about this way of life, it is now. So therefore, our commission is we must learn about this way of life and we must become experts and respected advisors about this way of life. Your co-workers need to know that you know about this way of life. And of course, the apostles did in Acts 5.20, completely different passage. It says, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. That's what, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to tell people about this message of life. Proverbs 15.22, plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. If you and I will talk about the way of life, this is the new commission, election's over, now what do we do? Now we tell them that the King of kings and the Lord of lords reign. There is this way of life. Let's get back to Acts 5, 533. When they heard this, the high council was furious and decided to kill them. Let's read to the part that's underlined. So here Gamaliel stood up, and notice what he did. He stood up and ordered that the men, that is the apostles, be sent outside the council chambers for a while. Now they were in front of them. The apostles have argued their case. And now Gamaliel does something that I believe is very discretionary. He sends the people outside of the room. And that's the question that we often ask. Are we inclusive? Should we be inclusive of everything that everybody hears? I was part of a church where the church felt like they needed to know everything about everything in order for them to make the right decisions. Sadly, it was a hybrid of gossip because everybody was saying everything to everybody about everything, and it just became a tension-filled church. So you too, you, you and your spouse may be constantly, how much do we reveal to our kids? What do we do? Do we bring them into discussion? How much of this do we? But here Gamaliel's made the decision to remove the apostles from this council to send them out. But Paul stays there. 
Paul hears the discussion. Paul knows what's going on. So we always have this question, when do we send people out? When do we include people? So my second point in my message is when we become like Gamaliel, we like Gamaliel must know when to include and exclude others in our discussion and our decision. Somebody wants to ask me, Pastor, do you want to be involved in this discussion? And I go, no, not really. Well, do you want to be involved in the decision? And I said, well, will it compromise my position with people? Some things I just don't want to know. Some things I just, I just want to love on people. And if it doesn't change the pastor, no, I really don't want to know some of these things. And the older I get, the less I want to know. And I go back to what I said years ago. I started writing a book. When the older saints come marching in, I never finished it. But the one thing I learned that made, I think, our society strong is that the older people learned the power of discretion. They know that people who have no discretion, it just victimizes people. It hurts people. So even though we have the choice and God has given us the choice, I thank God for the choice. The question is, at what point do we stop sharing all the things about our neighbor? In fact, parents ask me, should I let my kids know about my indiscretions? And I go, here's my best advice, no, until they're much, much older. When they're much, much older and they've understood complexities, that is, they're now sensible to bigger things. If you really feel like you need to share with them, maybe some of the discretions about your family, what grandma and grandpa may have done, who was born out of wedlock, who was, all of that. If, if you want to do that, fine, make sure that they're older. But to tell a teenager about your indiscretions, it does no good. Proverbs 2.11 says, wise choices will watch over you, understanding will keep you safe. And Ephesians 5.12 says, it is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret because there's no upswing. Really, the kids need to know what you've done post-Christ, not pre-Christ. Your kids need to know what you're doing as being influenced by the Holy Spirit. This is the way of life we need to teach our kids. And really, that's what we need to focus on. So people say, ah, oh, the church does this and the church did that. And I go, yeah, that's probably true. The church has made all kinds of mistakes. But let me tell you about the way of life that we now preach. Let me tell you about the hope that we now have. Let me tell you about things going forward. If you're understanding what I'm saying here this morning, say amen. amen. So Gamaliel, he became an expert. He became respected. And one of the reasons why he's respected is because he had discretion. He knew when to include people in discussion, when not, when to include people in the decision, when not. So in verse 35, it says, Then he said to his colleagues, Men of Israel, take care what you are planning to do to these men. Now Gamaliel does something, and he uses case study. If you talk with me, I will almost always tell you, let me tell you a story. I use case study. Any decision that I make, I almost always do case study. You know, that's what lawyers do. Lawyers will not even argue a case trying to defend a certain opinion without coming before the judge, and they, they basically cite case study. So-and-so versus so-and-so, this is the outcome. So-and-so versus this, this is the outcome. And here Gamaliel, who's brilliant, he says, look, if we're going to make a decision, let's talk about some case study. You know, we understanding the way of life because the Bible is a huge case study. It's a wonderful case study. Whenever we're about to make a decision, you can go back to the scripture and say, well, let's study some of the cases. What, what happened here? How did this happen? What, what were the cases here and what did God do? It can tell us about the nature of God. It can tell us how people behave, how to respond in the right way. So he says, men of Israel, take care of what you're planning to do to these men some time ago. And he cites the first case study. There was a fellow, Theodos, who pretended to be someone great. About 400 others joined him, but he was killed and his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. Verse 37, after him, at the time of the census, this is a second case study, there was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all the followers were scattered. Now here, the implications are that God has intervened. God has prevented it. So 38 says, so my advice is, leave these men alone. Leave these apostles alone. Let them go. If they are planning and doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. It can't stand. You know, people have a way of just seeing through things particularly us who are of the Spirit, God just has a way of revealing to us things. So there is a way to let people understand complexities without breaking confidentiality. 
There's just way of people coming to know what is right. And you know, Paul on the road to Damascus, he just came to know what was right because the Holy Spirit, that is God, we believe knocked him off of his horse, knocked him to the ground. And of course, he was blinded that day. But all of this was an influence upon him. And I think this too with Gamaliel, verse 39, but if it is from God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even find yourself fighting against God. What a cautionary tale. Let's see how this thing plays out. Let's see what God wants to do. Because there is a way of life that you and I follow, a Holy Spirit way of life, which brings me to my third point. Like Gamaliel, we must be discreet, calling for restraint and patience. Why? Because God has a plan. Therefore, we need to teach this way of life. We teach it to our kids. We teach it to everybody that we know. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise. As some people think, no, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So I'm telling you, we as elders of our church, we believe something is coming in 2021 where we will have a great opportunity to help our community find the way. We sense that. We've been gathering in prayer Tuesday mornings, and the Lord is speaking to us. There's these ideas that's just being planted in us. And it's not just one direct word. I wish it was. I wish it was as simple as that. But he puts these ideas, these thoughts, these deep feelings, these deep convictions, and we're seeing ourselves pointing people in a way, in a direction. We, we just keep seeing that. Uh, one image came out of an airline steward saying the pathway, you know, in an emergency, the pathway along the road will illuminate to the exit. There's this idea that there is this narrow path, but it's a path, but it's well illuminated, it's well lit. Uh, lit. God is going to show us the way. And this is the commission. I don't know how you feel right now about everything that's happening in our country, but if you're discouraged, if you're downtrodden, let me tell you, there is still a commission to go to the temple, that is to go to people's temple, people's hearts, people's lives, because now we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Go to people and tell them the way, this way of life. Proverbs eleven fourteen it says, without wise leadership, and this is you. Without wise leadership, this is you. You filled with the Holy Spirit, you're like the apostles. You are now an expert in the way. Without wise leadership, a nation falls. And there's safety in many advisors. And you are now being called to be one of those wise advisors. Respected and an advisor of the way. Wow, what a powerful commission you and I have. Acts 5.30, 40, Acts 5.40, it says, The others accepted his advice. They listened to Gamaliel, so they followed it. They called in the apostles and had them flogged. Then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And of course, we know the apostles went and kept teaching the way. But then it says in verse 41, And the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And you may not know this, but the world is watching. And I think the church is going to resume that comeback. Because there's nothing that can stop the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. So the apostles, they left that high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple, in the house, and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message, which is the way Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is Lord. God is still on the throne. God has not lost. Do you believe that? Say amen. Conclusion, when discretion is added to our sensibility, every decision-making process is made simple and our course of action becomes clear. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? We thank you, Father, that you have given us discretion. We can choose to go left, go right. We can choose the color of clothes that we wear. We can choose Thank you, Lord, that we are a people of choice. But Lord, also there is this action, this behavior that can either cause offense or not, things that we reveal about others, even about ourselves, that just becomes trouble. Or for that matter, we can choose to keep it to ourselves and not spread it at all. So Father, we choose now, because of discretion, 
because we are sensible people, and most of all, because we serve you and the Spirit bears witness in us, we take this new challenge, this new hope, this new vigor that 2021 will be a time of teaching the way, this way of life. So, Father, I'm asking you today, as the elders still have to articulate and formulate exactly what the vision statement for 21 will be, Lord, we pray that we would still be about this, the business. Jesus is Messiah. He is King. He is Lord. He is King and Lord of the whole earth. And nothing that happens, Lord, is at, at your blind spot. There is no blind spot in you. There's nothing hidden from you. Everything that is being done, it's just in full disclosure to you. So we pray, Lord, for our nation. We pray, Lord, for our church. We pray, Lord, for the people that we love. Father, help us to grow both in sensibility and in discretion because in that, every decision is made easier. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and everybody says, amen. Brian, if you will. Thank you, Pastor Thompson, for the wonderful word this morning. Um, we'd like to encourage you to stick around for a time of fellowship. We've got um, some cake out there. It's a special cake because once a year we honor our pastors. And uh, so please stick around and, uh, and thank Pastor Thompson, thank Pastor Casey for the investment that they've made, the call that they've answered to come here to commit their lives to, to the good of this flock. I don't know if you quite understand, but I hope you do. I, I'm, in fact, I'm assuming you do, the importance and the value of a covering. When you have pastors praying for you, all available for you if you need them, um, I, you may have grown up in a home where mom and a dad were covering you in prayer, and you may have thrived in that. Or maybe you missed some of that growing up, and, and we're sorry about that, but we know God can, can heal that. But if you're in this, if you consider Pastor Thompson and Pastor Casey your pastors, they are praying for you. They are hearing from God on behalf of you. And once a year, we'd like to thank them for that. So grab some cake. Thank the pastors for, for being there for you. And, and it is an honor again to, uh, to be with you this morning. Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless your people. I pray you bless their homes with peace, their bodies with health, their spirits with joy. Bring their relationship, relationships into the fullness of Christ so that you can be glorified in Jesus' name, you are dismissed.